Welcome to Future Thinkers Podcast, episode number 60. Today on the show, we have a very interesting guest. Don Roberto is a medical anthropologist and ayahuasca shaman who has spent his life learning various healing modalities with a particular emphasis on plant medicine. He's lived with the various native tribes around the world and studied their healing traditions, including the Shipibo in the Amazon, the Zulu in Africa, and the shamans of Bali. This is a fascinating conversation about his life and work. It's probably one of the most out there esoteric episodes that we've recorded, so it's best approached with an open mind. This episode will air in two parts. The show notes for both parts can be found at futurethinkers.org slash 60. We hope you enjoy. We've got a quick announcement. Mike and I will be speaking and podcasting at the Voice of Blockchain conference in Chicago on August 24th and 25th. If you'd like to join us there, you can go to futurethinkers.org slash Chicago and use the code futurethinkers to get $100 discount on the tickets. And before we get into the show, we'd like to say thank you to recent patrons, Vasilis, Mitch, and Mayan. Thanks, guys. This episode is brought to you by Qualia, a premium nootropic supplement that helps support mental performance and brain health. It's specifically designed to promote focus, support energy, mental clarity, mood, memory, and creativity. UV and I have both used it in the past. We really like it. And we actually met the founders and interviewed them on Future Thinkers. And you can check out those interviews. They're one of our favorites at futurethinkers.org slash Daniel and futurethinkers.org slash Jordan. They've got a new formula up called Qualia Mind. It's got more natural ingredients and you can get it at futurethinkers.org slash brain hack and you can get 10% off if you use the code future. All right, let's get into the show. Welcome to futurethinkers.org, a podcast about the evolution of technology, society, and consciousness. I'm Mike Gilliland. And I'm Yuvi Ivanova. If you're new to the show and you'd like a list of our top episodes and resources, go to futurethinkers.org slash start. And if you like our podcast, leave us a rating and a review on iTunes and elsewhere. It really helps others find the show and we really appreciate it. All right, guys, welcome to the show. This one's going to be interesting. We wanted to do ayahuasca for quite a number of years, and we got the opportunity to do it here over the weekend. And we're still kind of recovering from the experience. And uh, Yuvi, why don't you get into how we met Don Roberto? Yeah, we've been wanting to do ayahuasca for years, and we've tried to find ceremonies to participate in, but things didn't really align until suddenly, about a month ago, a friend mentioned that he was going to participate in an ayahuasca ceremony locally with a traveling shaman. We were kind of on the fence about it for a while. Then we decided to do it. And it all happened really perfectly, actually. The people, the setting, the organization. And Don Roberto was a great facilitator as well. And I'm really happy we got to do it. So it's now been a couple of days since the ceremony. And we have Don Roberto here with us today. So thank you for joining us. My pleasure. My pleasure to be here. So we had a lot of laughs over the weekend, too. It was really interesting to see the way you worked. I was really surprised uh, the first night. I was watching you quite a lot and watching your work, and I had such a huge respect for what you do. And uh, so maybe you can just give us a bit of your background uh, to start, and then we can get into a little bit more of the specifics of what being a shaman is. Well, I come from a mixed background. My mother is Spanish, and my stepfather is Indonesian. Uh, so I'm Eurasian, basically, but I grew up in England. But I think my story really began in um, when my parents moved to Indonesia when I was six, and I would spend a lot of time in my grandfather's study. And being the tropics and the extreme heat and light, the windows were all shuttered, these wooden blinds that you could just barely see out of. And so there was this amber light on the study table and this overhead fan. But this incredible collection of National Geographic magazines from the 1940s right up to the, the 70s. And so I would spend every afternoon just poring over those magazines and not necessarily reading the articles, but definitely absorbing the visual information of all the diversity of human cultures. And I think that was where my interest was, it was peaked in terms of wanting to know more about this planet and its peoples. And the thing about moving from England, which is where, where I was, uh, grew up as a child, to Indonesia was this kind of translocation of cultures and moving between realities. And when I think back on it, that was basically the, the beginning of my journey, being able to navigate these different kind of uh, social constructs and linguistic constructs and ideas. Uh, so, for example, thinking to myself, it's December, why is it not snowing? You know, having that reference and then having to adapt to that. So that's the beginning of my you know, childhood journey into moving between realities, which is a feature of, of shamanism. Yeah. 
So what was interesting about that is not just that one-way journey into Indonesia, but the journey back into the UK, having been exposed to Indonesian culture at various levels and then having to reintegrate. So that going backwards and forwards was a theme that you know became constant in my life as I grew up. Also, I spent a lot of time in Spain and the differences between Mediterranean cultures, Anglo Hispanic Mediterranean culture and uh, Anglo culture is quite immense in terms of how we handle ourselves, how loudly we speak, what we talk about, and even timings of meals and everything is very different. So the ability to mediate and navigate that success is a key feature of shamanism in general in terms of moving between realms and dimensions. I can see a very interesting benefit that you have this childhood and background culturally as a, a Westerner from Britain and that you can understand the Western mind so easily and then kind of bring over these older traditions and ways of thinking, bring over shamanism and make it understandable and, and palatable. For people, I found that to be very helpful. So, how did you become interested in esoteric stuff? I'm not quite sure. I think it's an innate knowing that there was much more than that was being represented to me. Because going back into England, you're living in a culture where people are very monolingual and also monocultural, and they don't realize there are other possibilities. So, I think there's always been an abiding sense that there's more than meets the eye, and there's other possibilities. And the world is a very big place, and there's lots to explore and discover. So, that's innate sense of what else is there has always been resident with me. And so, growing up, I was very curious, and I read a lot of science fiction. You know, that questing, I read huge amounts. I think in one year, I was reading like uh, nearly 300 books in one year. I was just devouring it when I was 13, 14. So that desire to know, explore. And, um, but in many senses, I had a very orthodox upbringing, private schooling, very straightforward English child growing up in a sense. But um, there was always that sense, as I said, of something more. And that really became more evident when I was hitting around the age of 18. Okay, so here's the turning point. So a relatively normal kid then grows up and is exposed to a magazine called Omni. Maybe some of your older listeners may remember this magazine, which was actually the sister magazine to Penthouse, but it was uh, Bob Guccione's uh, endeavor to be kind of a sensible human being and do something interesting. And it was science a fact and science fiction mixed together. So there was one article and it, it featured John Lilly. You guys know about John Lilly? Mm -hmm. All right, you know about John Lilly. John Lilly was a naval scientist who in the 50s was charged exploring the question whether the human mind, if denied stimulus, to find out what would happen. Would it go to sleep or would it basically start generating information on its own? And he, did, he basically developed this uh, tank that would isolate the person from stimulus. As little gravity as possible, you couldn't tell where your body began and ended because the temperature differential was minimum, and uh, darkness and no sound. And so he built the world's first isolation tank, now known as a flotation tank. And so what happened when he was, he was doing self-discovery, uh, he basically put himself there and he, no, the brain didn't go to sleep. In fact, what happened is he jump-started himself to the level where yogis have been trying to get to for, in all their training with no distraction, no, no survival mechanisms kicking in in terms of orientation, in terms of gravity, things attacking you, just complete, absolute you know, self-containment. And then the brain went to a whole different level. And as he did so, he discovered that these portals opened up into different dimensions. And I'm reading this, and then also at the same time, this is the period of the LSD, and so he's taking LSD in the tank, and even more things emerge, and ketamine, and I'm like, I'm thinking to myself, hang on a minute, he's getting paid to do this. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm thinking to myself, they didn't tell me this at careers, you know, at school, at careers office at school, you know, he was a librarian or, you know, firefighter, but never like, you know, weird, mad scientist. So that was really inspirational. And so my drug-taking career really stems from these days, but not in the sense of I wanted to get high. I just wanted to see what the effects were and the parameters of how they impacted consciousness. And so I did explore, uh, but was never really something that I, was, I had an addiction towards. I just took it very minimally in terms of finding out in fact, and sometimes I had to push myself to take things that people had given me because I was at university and very busy. And so it's like I open my drawer, I go, oh, I've got some marijuana there. I must smoke it sometime. And then off I went to do other things. So that was a very seminal turning point in terms of opening my mind to this whole possibility. Well, but your interest in shamanism came quite later. It did. And actually, it wasn't um, obvious that that was going to be a, a point of departure. So here's what happened. So at university, I decided to do Chinese and Spanish and linguistic as a, I'm a language major. And it so happened that uh, somebody turned me on to something called NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming. I read all the early books, and I actually then went back and read the very first book that those guys had written called The Structure of Magic. 
And what was very interesting is that they were taking these ideas from Chomsky about deep structures in the brain in terms of generating language, but also if you examine the surface structures of sentences that people are producing, you can actually spot the deviations in their thinking and the distortions in their thinking. So I thought, oh my goodness, we can use language to heal people by actually deconstructing what they're saying and then pointing that out to them. So then I got very interested in NLP as a phenomena, and then I got interested in hypnosis. So I then did training in hypnosis, and I did a two-year training. And at the end of that training, I got this thing through the post, a uh, flyer. And it was an amazing picture because it, had, it depicted a clam. It was divided into top and bottom, and the bottom were all these scenes of childhood abuse, children crying, broken mirrors, that kind of thing. And the top was beautiful because it was transformation, children playing happily, and it was called Healing the Child Within. And it was a presentation that was going to take a place in London with a guy called David Grove. And this is just after I graduated. So I've done all the traditional Ericksonian hypnosis and blah, blah, blah. And this looked very intriguing in terms of visually. It was very, very astonishing. So I signed up for this and uh, I had no idea what I was going to walk into. But the person presenting it was a New Zealander called David Grove. And he was very, very unusual because he was not attached to any way of working particularly. He wasn't coming from a particular school, even though he had uh, initially trained in NLP, because he was interested in what the client had to say, rather than importing in his own model. Because when he was studying counselling, he read all these transcripts of all these very famous people like Carl Rogers and Virginia Satir, and they had ostensibly said, oh, we're client-focused or client-centred. And then he read the transcript, and he noticed a, a, a very interesting thing, that the client would say something like, scared. And then the, the therapist would say, oh, yes, you're frightened. So then the client would just take a moment and say, I have to reframe that to understand the word that came out of the, client, of the therapist, not their word. So David began to notice that a word that his client generated, scared, might have completely different connotations to frightened. And so they'd have to translate that the, what the therapist said and kind of create this kind of like, you know, a break in the, in the flow of their information as they had to kind of mediate between different systems. So David thought to himself, oh, so what would happen if I kept myself out of the picture? If I didn't impose my own words? If I just kept very closely to what the client was saying and fed that back to them? So in order to do that, he developed a protocol of clean questions. So a client would say something like, um, a bubble. What kind of bubble? Does it have a shape and a size? You know, what happens next? Questions that don't impose a model, but allow the client to connect se sequentially with their own information and go deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. And he was getting things like uh, people saying, I feel like a knife in the heart or butterflies in the stomach or a blob. Metaphors are symbols that traditionally the therapist would say, oh, I know what that means, and try and impose it into a system. So, but here, David would basically say, I'm going to run with this. I have no idea what you're talking about, but I'm going to ask questions. And so these metaphors actually started to grow and develop and actually emerge in space and time as a real living process that was connected to their internal universe. There's this whole universe behind a knife. Let's say there's a knife in the heart. Is there anything else about a knife? Oh, there's a hand attached to it. And when it's a hand, what kind of a hand? It's a male hand. And what kind of a male hand is that? It's an angry male hand. And so suddenly this whole kind of landscape emerges. So the beautiful thing about his work is that these symptoms that were being presented because people said, you know, I want to stop this pain or whatever, when they started to explore the landscape, they would find the resolution or the solution to those problems or pains contained somewhere in the landscape. So what he was showing us and myself was that there's this mythopoetic landscape that everybody has, but is not normally accessible. So in terms of working with the client, very often they would be presenting symptoms that contain trauma. And the trauma was very early. The trauma was often childhood trauma. Sometimes it was pre-verbal. So they couldn't actually get a, a handle or leverage about to talk about it because it was happening at a time before language. But the symbols and metaphors had a vitality in life and a, and a logic to themselves. So he could question those symbols and allow them to speak for themselves. What would happen is that he would go into space, the, the actual picture would emerge, and there would be the child. And then he'd ask these gentle questions, and it would then appear that the consciousness of the child had fragmented, and had fragmented into space. So let's say a child is on a table, and there's a bigger person above them doing something to them. And of course, the child hasn't got the physical strength to escape. But what they can do is use that line of sight to escape into the curtains or escape into the weave of the wood. 
and remain there. So the physical thing is happening, but their consciousness is not there anymore. It's actually displaced. And so what he began to discover is that the fragmentation of the psyche could be invited to come back. And what he was basically doing was astonishing because it was what shamans called soul retrieval, recovering the parts that have fragmented through trauma okay, and then bringing them back and integrating the, the, them back into the, the main consciousness. And to watch this actually play out in real time, because all he's doing is he has no idea what's going to come up. He's just asking some very, very simple questions and this whole landscape emerges and this whole beauty and transcendence that's inherently resonant within everybody is there on display actually happening. And then at the final moment, the resolution of all the different parts, blah, 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 blah. It was astonishing. And I was grateful because when I watched him work, I thought this man is a genius on the level of Freud and Jung. The work he's doing, the tack he's doing, and the simplicity and, and his, the inquiry of his mind was really inspirational. So many years later, I realized that what he was doing exactly was shamanic work. The shamanic work that is soul retrieval. Let me explain what soul retrieval is. In anyone's life, there's going to be a moment where external circumstances are going to be a little bit too much for where that consciousness is. An example, you're two years old, your mom's in the kitchen, the door is closed, you're behind the door, and you can't quite reach for the door handle. The child is going to get anxious, maybe panic, and then that's a moment where it's just overwhelming, overwhelming, and, and part of them can actually flip out in order to protect the main frame of the consciousness, like a safety fuse. When the system gets overloaded, something has to shut down in order to protect the, the house ele electrics. We recognize what this is in Western science and psychology. We recognize this as disassociation. A person comes in, they're dissociated. But the question that is never asked is, and when someone dissociates, where do they dissociate to? And that's what shamans do. They travel into these realms and find those missing parts and bring them back. David was also traveling into the consciousness of the person, but allowing them to be the guide and allowing them to recover the parts and bringing them back. And so but he was doing it in a very, in very contemporary and linguistic way, and the shamans are doing it in obviously traditional ways. And so that was really inspirational for me to see that happen, to see the magic that is resident and potential within everybody and to see how it was done and to see the healing that emerged from it. So that was enormously powerful. It didn't quite make me uh, say, oh, I want to be a shaman, because I didn't recognize it as such. I saw it as a very powerful healing modality. So, but again, another milestone in that development to see the mythopoetic potential and to see how it could be done and to see the results. Because once those parts come back, then what also comes back is the knowledge of a two-year-old that is, has its own wisdom or knowledge of a five-year-old, which is very different wherever you are at five. Also, sometimes those parts took away with them when they left the capacity to feel. So what is left is this kind of numbed or husk of a person that has no access to real capacity of feeling. So to, to see that come back and to see the integration was quite astonishing thereafter with David. If I'm walking in the big cities, I just look at people's eyes and you can see that wholeness is not there in most people. People often aren't able to articulate what's wrong, but they will, if something is major enough, they'll say, and this happened and I was never the same again. Mm -hmm. So they, they notice the juncture, they notice the, 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 the fracture without being able to talk about it. Do you think there are any modern Western therapies that come close to this kind of work? Is this guy's school or method being practiced currently? It's evolved, and, but the actual practitioners are not working so much in that field. They're doing different things. It's still effective. I mean, I, I think I'm going to restart, reboot that and start doing that as a different way of working for people who aren't comfortable with, with the, the woo-hoo, the shamanism, but who are more comfortable with the kind of cerebralness. But yeah, other ways. I think psychodrama would be a way of accessing a certain... I mean, I think there's various approaches. None would actually consciously articulate themselves or present themselves as, as a soul retrieval, but... I hesitate because, for example, the work that I do in terms of soul retrieval, it really does go into some very, very personal and mythological spaces that I'm guided into, but I don't think is very easily accessible. Let me give you an example. So I'm working with a client in South Africa, and she asked me to do the soul retrieval for her. Now, the way soul retrieval works is that I need to go into an altered state of consciousness, and I do that through drumming. And so... I then take a journey into a space which I'm familiar with and meet my ally, which is a power animal. The power animal knows where these parts are. I don't. So I say, hey, <laughs> we're going on a little journey. This is little Mary or whatever her name is. And not little Mary, this is big Mary. Let's find those parts. And so my the power animal says, like, fine, let's go. And we go. And in this occasion, I was taken 
out into the atmosphere and further beyond, I'm finding myself in space, my consciousness is in space. I'm like, where are we going? We land on the moon. I'm like, are you kidding me? We're on the moon, right? And there they are, they're the parts, you know. And of course, this is not 3D reality. This is consciousness. It can reside anywhere in any kind of magical state and the normal rules of reality that don't apply. And so I'm, I'm thinking to myself, well, normally I'd be like uh, in a vacuum dying and so would she, but this doesn't matter, right? So this is the reality. So we're in the moon and I say, hi, I'm here on behalf of Big Mary. Would you like to come back? Do you like it here? And they're like, oh, yeah, we're a bit bored. I said, yeah, okay, would you like to come back and reintegrate? Okay, so then I take their hands. And then we pour that Peter Pan, we go back from that space, that never, never land of their uh, consciousness back into this reality 3D. And I'm carrying the energy. And then the client is usually lying down and they're basically, I kneel over them and I take my hands and make a little, and they go, <laughs> transfer the energy of their consciousness and their, their, their life force. And then into, into the crown chakra, I get them to sit up and then, <laughs> and then I seal it. So then anyway, I didn't want to leave them. So... Um, talking afterwards. So when you were a kid, did you like to look at the stars? She goes, oh, you know, the moon, that was my favorite place. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> you know, so I do the reality checking sometimes and I just, you know, and very often it's, it's astonishing. So I don't go in with an agenda, but I do like to check afterwards. And there was a time as well, I found myself working for another client and journeying up this like eerie, up straight up this cliff up to an eerie and there's this like eagle's nest. And there are two little girls sitting in, in the eagle's nest, but tucked underneath them is a boy. And I'm like, the ladies and the girls I can, I'm cool with, but are you sure you're meant to be here? Because yeah, yeah, I'm meant to be here. Do you belong to so-and-so? Yeah, yeah, I belong to so-and-so. All right, here we go. Okay, hold hands, now we go. And so we do the whole thing. <laughs> See, he'll talk to her afterwards. I says, so, I find two little girls, but I also find a little boy. She goes, oh yeah, that's me. I said, would you care to elaborate? Oh, yeah, I was a tomboy. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's, it's this, you know, continuous checking in with the clients. And even though things get really strange, I'm not one to question because it's, it's not my, I'm just the visitor to their domain, to their consciousness, if that makes any sense. So the effects, I think just to wind up that point about soul retrieval, the effects can be powerful in the sense that sometimes they just go, I want to make a crazy sandwich that a child would eat. And they just want to express that childish part. Or this other guy, you might relate to this, the other guy came through, he's like 35, and he just said, I don't know what's been happening, but I've been playing video games all week. <laughs> like a 15-year-old, right? The, the most important thing is this integration of the younger self with the older self. And the younger self will often want to uh, physically manifest their age and do things in an, or, or, or act out in some way. And then the older self will probably, in dream space, actually do the teaching because they've got valuable lessons to teach each other and an integration. So sometimes what happens is that people around them react differently to them. Another guy came in in Cairo, as, actually, as it happens, he goes, I don't know what's happening, but no one's giving me any shit. My boundaries are really, you know, and I'm not taking it. And it's just like, I don't know, it's really strange because people would just abuse him and just use him. And, and, and it's like, whoa, something has happened. Do you have any kind of an explanation from the materialist scientist perspective of what kind of transference is happening between you and the client and you and the spirit animal like it sounds metaphorical and i know from experience with these things that it's not um, totally metaphorical there are potentially higher dimensions that you're interacting with this person on but what is your explanation for what's happening you use the word transference but i mean i understand transference in, in terms of psychoanalysis so I, i'm not quite sure what you mean what do you actually mean Let's a transfer of energy between you a transfer of information or, or something that allows you to interact with this person's unconscious one aspect of shamanism is is entering the imaginal realms and those realms actually have a reality and so they may seem very ephemeral or mm, what's the word gossamer like or unreal but they do have a tangible reality of their own as long as you are able to get behind it and as long as, long as you're able to s sit in that energy and that power and believe in it itself. If you ask for a materialist explanation, a, f a physicist would say, well, it's just bunk, it's just rubbish, it's just, you're delusional. However, I'm very much focused on results. And if it means that I have to imagine this whole process and imagine bringing this energy down and bringing it to the person and they, it yields results, then I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> really, what a physicist says, because these guys are playing with quarks and, you know, all kinds of imaginary numbers anyway, so they're off their tits. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> different way. Yeah. 
and you're and you're testing, so you're yeah, you're I getting mean, real testing. feedback here, yeah, and, yeah. and you know it works. So it's it's interesting, and you know I, that it doesn't matter because you're just doing it anyway. Yeah, yeah. And all that matters is the client gets the result. Now it might be that when when I had my very first soul retrieval, I I was really blown away by it because I could feel this electric charge, life force coming back to me. I was open to that. I felt that, and that was my tangible experience. Other people, it's very minimal. They don't actually feel that. But then, then they report they have waves of crying and you know, and, and sobbing and grief and all that kind of coming up. So something is happening. Whether we're activating the, you know, the um, the the, the um, unconscious in a different way, I, I don't really want to get into the discussion of the theory and dynamics of that. It's what's important is, you know, did, was it worthwhile for them? Did they did they come to some kind of interior uh, alignment? That's all that matters. Do we do some healing there? Did. So when I, when I work with clients, I don't actually tell them the story. I mean, sometimes I'm not privy to the story of why the parts are there, which is great. I don't want to know why they're there. They're obviously there for a reason, wherever they are. But secondly, when they bring them back, I just said, look, what was yours originally has been returned to you. And it's up to them to integrate that and make the best. So minimal projection, essentially. It was interesting being in the, the ceremony itself and watching you work, because I've never actually... No one's ever, that, as far as I know on YouTube of all my researching, has recorded the actual ceremony going on and showing what the shaman is doing. And that was fascinating to watch, and especially with the added layer of the ayahuasca. And part of my intention coming into it was just to experience joy and fascination. And that's exactly what I got just watching you. And it was interesting to see all the different kind of journeys people were on and see the layers of, of what was going on because of what I was experiencing on the ayahuasca. And then watching you notice the same thing, go to these people and then kind of coax something out of them, it seems. And oh, it right. Was, so you, you actually saw that. Yeah. You, where your attention was going was where my attention was going yes. at the same time. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So you're in the field, you see. So you're also sensitive to the, the energetic dynamics. Mm -hmm. It was just amazing to watch. And I, I would have been, before that, I, well, I've done enough experimentation with consciousness to, to be open to that kind of thing. But to actually see it happening with someone else's witnessing the same thing, it was, it was a new experience for me mm -hmm. completely. So maybe you can take us a bit through what you're doing in, in the process. And, uh, and I, it's interesting because it, from my perspective, just observing, it looks like you're kind of taking, the, there's a lot of healing happening. It's definitely healing. And there's a lot of like difficulty that people are going through. And it looks like you're going to them and kind of pulling it out of them and taking it onto yourself. Is that what's happening? Let me give you a run through the actual, the moment in time where I'm sitting in front of you to actually work with you. Because, I mean, there's a lot of other things that are happening in the space. But again, we come back to this central idea within shamanism that it's not me, purely. All shamanism that's worth its salt is about partnership. Whether we're working with a drumming tradition and our animals or we're working with the plants, there has to be an ally or partnership. And it's those spirits that we work with that guide us. It's almost as if I have an earpiece in my ear and it's the medicine then says, or the spirits of the plants, not just the ayahuasca, but various plants inside me and say, this person needs help now or this person will need help next. Or even I'm thinking, <laughs> sometimes I'm thinking, I'm going to sing this song and then I open my mouth and something else that pops up. Like, oh, obviously we're singing this kind of song. So it's not something that comes from the headspace. It's really something that is guided from a different source. And so if I'm going to sit in front of you, so what I do is I, you might have noticed I take some time to actually observe. I've got my eyes closed, but I'm tuning into the energetics. And so I might be really saying, hmm, there's a lot of anger in the liver here. Or the sacrum carries uh, some stuff from the, the ancestral lineage that is blocking you because you're carrying the trauma. And that's the thing. This, the whole vision changes. It's not just the individual as an atomized self. It's the whole extension in time and space. I haven't said this yet, but I trained as a medical anthropologist. And so we're looking at different, my master's was in that. My field work was in Africa. And so one of the interesting things about that work and that research was that um, when we get sick, we'll go to a doctor often and we'll get the prescription, the medication, and we'll take it and then we'll, we'll get better and then we don't think about it. For the Tswana people in Botswana, they know the efficacy for certain biomedicines. They say, if this is happening, this is the best thing for it. What's really interesting is that they'll then go back to the community and say, hey, I have this symptom, these diseases or this, this condition. What does it mean for the social body? What does it mean for the community? So the focus isn't as an atomized individual, you know, it's just happening to me, but it's actually a reflection or a symbolic, you know, kind of commentary on wider uh, sphere. And so in a sense, you know, we tend to see ourselves as, you know, this, this container that is 
unique and uh, not particularly connected community, but also not connected to our genealogies. And one of the most important things in this work, there is a definite appreciation and respect for the things that we carry through energetic lineage in terms of what we are recipients for today. And this is problematic because it didn't happen in your biography. Whatever trauma happened in the past, it didn't happen in your lifetime. So therefore, you don't necessarily have the resources to deal with it. It's, you're carrying this weight that you would maybe not able to articulate what it is, but it might be a very indistinct feeling or a limitation. And so that's why we are actually sometimes doing the work, have to go all the way back to where that stemmed and heal there and then bring it forward and then help you release. I think this is a pretty esoteric concept for most people that there is a memory beyond this human lifetime. Some people think it's super woo thing, but having done a lot of meditation and now having done this ayahuasca ceremony, it's beyond doubt for me that we carry memory of all sorts. I mean, we carry genetic memory from two billion years of evolution or however long it's been. And then there's memory before that as well. The chemical compounds that came before organic compounds had some sort of consciousness or awareness of themselves because I was, <laughs> it's funny, just anecdote. Uh, I couldn't sleep at all last night because I kept getting this information coming through about chemical compounds and um, wave and particle phenomena and the swarm intelligence and all kinds of stuff. And I had one of the things that it came to me is that, uh, you know, you see a, a bubble of molten metal or water, how it, it has surface tension. It knows where it ends and something else begins. It has a sense of what it is. And you see this with a lot of non-organic elements. Why wouldn't this kind of memory or information get passed down in some form? It's probably just very, very buried and we don't normally have access to it in, in waking consciousness, but then in these altered states or therapy sessions, you can access it. And also indigenous cultures, they don't come from the historical matrix of science, that they are more um, open to actually seeing the world as a living dynamic organism in its own right. And everything has consciousness, even the apparently inorganic things or things like stones and plants. And it seems a bit preposterous until you try that model on for yourself and say, well, what would it be like if we actually, matter is consciousness, you know, is it just energy in a different form? And then you go, okay, and how do I meet that? And how do I respect that? And how do I acknowledge it? And how do I work with it? So, for example, I'm going to come back to your original question. Don't worry, I haven't forgotten. But um, the whole idea about ayahuasca is that um, in the jungle, there's 180,000 different species, supposedly. And the possibility of connecting the two plants that work together is one in six billion. So in terms of trial and error and scientific, scientific methodology, you'd have wiped out whole generations of, of communities just trying to find out what this is. And so and when anthropologists ask the indigenous people, how did you arrive at this perfect combination? They come up with a statement, the forest told us, the jungle told us, which indicates there's another way of knowing. There's an epistemology that is not accessible to a Western-trained mind. And so I'm the kind of person that will say, hey, if they're saying this works, why don't we try it and see if this, it yields results? It's very empirical. And coming back to my early years, when I was 18, I read, I was reading a lot of books on unexplained phenomena, the mysterious world, et cetera, et cetera. And there was this book and it said, if when the Native American Indians were tired, they would go to a tree and ask the tree to, for the energy to recharge. I thought, this is a very, very, very good idea. Let's go and try and ch check it out. If it works, fantastic. So under the cover of darkness, lest anybody think I was completely crazy and a tree hugger, <laughs> which I actually am, um, I went, there was a park in my house and there was a beautiful oak tree. And I approached it and I asked permission to get near it. And then I came closer and then I asked permission to receive its energy. And I actually, I don't think I actually touched it, but I felt, first of all, I felt this huge wave of energy coming through me, like a clean river. And I was like, oh my goodness, that was the first thing. And then secondly, at a deeper level, my mind quietened down and then I connected with this awareness of the tree, very slow and majestic. And then I connected with the fact that not only was it slow, and majestic and aware, but that it was aware of me. So there was a meeting of consciousnesses that was really an epiphany for me. I was astonished because this thing then moved from the category of thing in the environment to living, you know, noble being aware of our presence and doing its own thing and conscious and worthy of acknowledgement as a, as a sacred being. And so that was 18 and that was, that was a significant paradigm change for me. You know, because I, like everybody, I took biology classes, but they were just things that were, were objectified and, and, and dissected and analyzed, but not really connected with. So that was very important for me. 
Make sense? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah, so what I'm saying is that there are ways of knowing that are not necessarily accessible because we've shut off, you know, especially with a hyper-masculine, logical, scientific methodology. It, it actually denies a lot of ways of knowing that are intuitive, that are feminine, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that's the part of my part is to recover some of these ways of knowing and to also um, give space and voice to the quantum because the quantum actually, quantum possibilities are resident in, at every moment. And it's about making that wave into particle, particle into the wave, whatever it is. And that's also part of the work we're doing. We're seeing possibilities emerge. And so when I sit in front of you, I see what are the main um, things to work with. I have my eyes closed, but I'm actually feeling into it and seeing it and also getting little messages. I'm going to talk about ayahuasca and soul retrieval now, and it's a funny story because normally they're very different domains and I do them at different times. So I'm in a ceremony in, in Asia, and I'm sitting in front of this Californian guy, and then the medicine says, he needs soul retrieval now. I'm like, what? They're completely different you know, times and spaces. No, he needs it now. And he didn't incarnate fully into his body. I'm like, what? What are you talking about? Just do it. <laughs> Okay, so in order to go into that state of consciousness, which is slightly different, I have to take my shaker and like a drum beat, ch -ch 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 -ch, and I shift again into a different state of consciousness. Then I have to journey to find my power animal. And uh, so then I find myself in front of him, facing this alien being with multiple limbs that are shifting and changing all the time, dynamically, like retracting and pulling in and emerging, you know, these, these, these kind of uh, uh, pseudo limbs coming out. And he's also shifting in dimensions. And I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> Normally I'm dealing with children, right? Like, hi, hey, would you like to come back and see little Johnny, little Johnny come back to big, big Johnny, blah, blah. No, I'm dealing with an alien being that is shifting, face shifting in, in dimensionality and is changing its form all the time. I'm like, which bit do I grab hold of? <laughs> <laughs> and how? So I, I kind of sat with that problem and I said, I'm going to become equal and opposite to this being. When it puts this thing out, I'll be the container. If it's phase shifts, I'll match it in phase shifting. And so then I basically poured this energy and I blew it into his body. And again, top of the head. And I'm like, well, that was strange. <laughs> and in the morning we had a little chat and I said, you know, the medicine said that, uh, I didn't tell him about the alien being, but I said, the medicine said you didn't fully incarnate into the body when you were born. He goes, well, that's really strange because I've never really referred to myself in the first person. It's John thinks this and John says that. I'm like, okay, yeah, really, some really strange stuff happens. So um, coming back to sitting in front of you, I'm looking and I go, okay, this is where it's going to go. And then basically what I do is I create that channel to the realms and then connecting the energy of the plants and I'm bringing it down. This is why I sing, this is channel. I'm making a channel. I'm physically doing this. And then I basically open you at different levels, open your body and your uh, consciousness and your soul, spirit, and then uh, aligning your chakras. And, you know, basically the first thing is the opening of the alignment. And then we go into the actual cleansing part. And it's an invitation. So when I'm singing, even though you don't understand the language, the intentionality is received by your consciousness. And you've got, I remember, oh, I didn't say this before, but after I've scanned, I then do some tobacco work and I take tobacco, which is a sacred plant teacher in North and South America. And it has its own power, its own wisdom, its own teachings. And I sing to it to awaken the spirit in the, in the mapacha, the rolled tobacco. And then I infuse the intention into it. And so then you sit in front of me and you put your hands out, fingers, prayer position, and I basically blow. <sighs> And so the smoke goes on the outside, but the energetic goes on the inside. And I track that because I'm holding your fingertips. I track as it goes through your body. And then I direct it. I go, oh, it needs to go, oh, okay, just there. And I, I request, I'm working together with tobacco to position itself. So after, you know, I work with your whole body, the top of the head, and various, then I look at different parts and go, oh, that's a bit of energetically lacking. And I direct the smoke there. And then tobacco is in your body waiting together with the ayahuasca that's already there. So then I sing this song full of quantum possibility and suggestions to align and cleanse and blah, 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 taking out trauma, taking out shock, taking out fear, taking out blockage, and then we finish. And then the final thing is, do you remember I actually blow again? I take your hands and blow. So what I'm actually doing there is I'm transferring the whole energetic of the song into you, like a capsule. Here you go. That's exactly what I just sang as a whole combined, combined thing. Activate. <sighs> Then I leave, and about three minutes later, bleh, they're all <laughs> like, bingo. 
it's, it's even today is still astonishing because I, I know tobacco is like thank you tobacco good you know because I could feel it waiting and it receives all that directives and suggestions and it goes right let's go to work yeah and then it does what it does <laughs> your face <laughs> it is magic it is magic you know it's amazing and this is a wondrous world and why why can't we have this level of you know wonder and amazement and magic and possibility to because we are magical beings yeah. at heart. This is so far outside of the realm of the paradigm, you know, of the Western understanding that some people listening to this would be like, wow, this guy's completely bonkers, but... <laughs> well, I would say, fuck you. <laughs> you need to read Thomas Kuhn, The Paradigm of Scientific Revolutions, 1972, because all science is ready to be updated according to new information. Yeah. And if you don't have that mindset, then you're the crazy one. Yeah. yeah. That's not real science if you're not willing to <laughs> let it be updated. Exactly, exactly. And there were so many moments in that ayahuasca <laughs> ceremony and now after that I just, things keep happening that I'm just like, how is this a thing? I don't, I can't. I can't comprehend it. Like I was just getting all this information about the structure of chemical compounds and magnetic fields and it was all fractal and how it relates to like how societies are structured and how people interact with each other. And it's like, I haven't really read up on this stuff very much. And I was getting all this information all night long, like on a drip feed. And then also uh, there were a couple times where I realized that I could read dead languages or understand languages that I didn't previously think I could speak. And I mean, th there's like the, the logical explanation that I came up with is that well, you know, all of the Indo-European uh, language groups, they were all one language at some point. And before that, you know, all people spoke the same language and it's written in the genes somewhere and I'm still carrying it. And so there's a deep part of me that can read any language on earth, basically, to some you know level of proficiency. But I mean, this kind of stuff is just, it's mind blowing. But then when you see it for yourself and it's not just a concept, when you actually experience it with your whole being, it's like, it's a paradigm shift, for sure. It's very intense. And I'm very clear in the sense that I don't want to present myself as an authority or a guru. How I see myself is a facilitator of space for you to do the discovery. I'm very much a Gnostic. I really believe that what we know firsthand, that we know for ourselves, is the most valuable source of information because it's something you've empirically been through. And, uh, you know, so it's anecdotal. So what? It happened to you. That's all that matters. You know, you know it for yourself. Rather than that, it's secondhand, somebody else tells you it's written down or it's transmitted or somebody believes this. It's like, oh, this, you went through that. So well, the important thing is what changes for you after you go through experience like that? What happens to your world? <laughs> <laughs> As you accommodate, it's like, oh, okay, maybe we're not in Kansas anymore, you know, we're, we're somewhere else. My, that's my question. What's happened for you in the sense of having had these experiences? I'm still integrating, to be honest. It's kind of hard to say. It's only been a couple of days. One of the things that, that we did in the ceremony that was really great is a sharing after, where everybody went in a circle and, and talked about their experience because... Sometimes you can't put something into words, but other people maybe experience something similar and they say something and something triggers something else in your head and you're like, oh, bam, I got it now. And so that was really great. Um, but oh, one of the things that I noticed is that I felt like my being was full, just so full during the ceremony. Like I wasn't operating just on a sliver of possibility or of what I am, everything was just filled to the brim. Like the channel was very busy. There was so much coming through and it was an incredible feeling. Like while it was happening, it like I can't imagine what it would be like to be alone or sad or incomplete or unhappy. Like in that particular moment, it was just so full. And then afterwards, it was a bit rough to integrate because when I came down from it, I was like, oh, I feel so empty, like a discarded husk. <laughs> but while it was happening, it was so incredible. And that changes a lot of things for me because I was really depressed as a teenager and in my 20s. And now that's completely flipped on its head. What I'm getting is it's almost like being a member of our society and then suddenly becoming a member of the Swana society where they, they look at things as a community. So as Westerners, we're quite atomized and we're all of us navigating our own ship in a sense, but it can be a bit lonely. And what happens, I believe, in the medicine experience is you're connected to a higher transcendent state where there is more, much more unity. You're connecting with much more divine levels in the sense of, and, and this is your heritage. And so to come back into that kind of, you know, that um, 
just you steering a lone ship is kind of very hard once you've been connected to that. But it's part of the challenge. I mean, we're, we're here to do our work. But also what happens with those groups that work with medicine is that there is bonding and there is community spirit develop and interaction thereafter. And that's where the real work starts to play out in terms of that's where you can make the difference in creating these conscious communities, you know, because that, that space to do so is very rarely found in our society. That was one of the things that happened to me, actually. I became so in tune with everybody's needs. And normally, Mike and I are very isolated, and we're kind of in our own bubble, just doing a lot of creative output and a lot of reading and meditation, that kind of stuff. We don't interact with the community very much. And this was such a, like a switch was flipped for me. I was suddenly just aware of everybody's needs. One guy had a very sore back. I just ran up to him and massaged his back. Another person just seemed really scared and sad. And I came up to her and just like hugged her for maybe five minutes straight and just hugged her and almost didn't say anything. And then she calmed down and just things like that. I just felt an urge to help people and I knew exactly what they needed and I gave it to them in that moment. That was such a... Wow, that level of connection is amazing. Yeah. yeah. How about you, Mike? How, how was your experience? Well, it confirmed a lot of what has been intuition and experience through other kind of psychedelic journeys and meditation and that kind of stuff. I've had a lot of intuition about what is going on in higher levels of consciousness and potentially dimensions. But I'm always interested in how it translates back. How can I communicate this to people? Partially because of this podcast. I want to figure out how to take the most rational, hard-nosed scientific mind and get them to open up to this kind of thing. And so I study a lot of sciences. I study a lot of whatever I can to explain these phenomenons, sci phenomenon books, um, synchronicity books, any, anything like that. And then there seems to be, like you say, there's, there's definitely practical things you can tap into right away and you can get results and you know exactly that this thing works. But I'm constantly looking for the explanation. And I can't say that I actually got one from this experience, but it's kind of filling me in. So what explanation are you looking for? Are you looking for a unified theory? Or... Yes. Hmm. <laughs> uh, I think it exists. I really do. Well, that's the fun. That's the, the joy that you're on a quest to find out and see wh where you can connect in your own way a puzzle that makes sense to you. Yes. So talking about the scientists, I don't think there's any amount of uh, talking will convince them. You know, because they're, you know, they're rooted in a, in a reality that they haven't actually transcended. Which is a huge problem in the scientific community anyway. If people aren't willing to let their models be updated, they're not doing science anyway. So yeah, okay. I'm really looking for actual scientists who will update their model when evidence presents itself. And there are certain things that I've repeated this a thousand times on this podcast before. Just because you don't have proof that something exists doesn't mean it does not exist. That's not how the scientific method works. You're disproving, disproving, disproving until you can actually definitively disprove that something is not the way that it is. Absolutely. Otherwise, it's all open. It's all potential. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, I've, I've had experience with precognition. I've told stories about this all the time. I constantly have sort of insights in what's going to happen in a few minutes or a few hours or days. I have visions sometimes from sleeping. Uh, dreams about what's happening in other places. And, and this is just happening more. I've grown to accept it. So I'm just looking for explanation uh, of what's happening um, because I already accept it. I just don't know why, <laughs> why it's happening or how it's happening. I think one of the most powerful lessons that working with ayahuasca can teach is the experience itself reveals, if you think about it logically, if one can have access to higher dimensions and have multidimensional experiences, what does it make you? Multidimensional being, exactly. for sure. And if you're a multidimensional being... Why aren't we resident more in that multidimensionality state? There are these kind of questions that I ask because really, you know, the, the bliss state should be there. Gamma brain waves should be a constant and accessibility between the realms should be easy. So I ask myself, you know, what is it about a society that gears us into, into lo or locking us down into a certain kind of frequency? And why aren't we, you know, fully occupying what is our natural heritage? I ask as a tool to leverage those kind of questions through direct experience. Because you then know, you, you, at least you have a transcendent experience. You go, well... It's not quite what I imagined, you know. And I have worked with psychiatrists and I have worked with, you know, physicians. And they do come away going, I, like I did when I first ex experienced it. Well, you know, obviously I don't know quite as much as I thought I knew. Because you're in the presence of beings or spirit beings that actually say, hey, there's much more to this world than meets the eye. You know, it isn't just a materialistic, positivistic 3D reality. There's a lot more going on. So, um, 
I have to measure myself because certain stories will freak people out because they're just not ready to make that that jump. But what I try and do as a Western and academically trained person who has the ability to just sit in those indigenous realities and try them on, and, and but to, I have the ability to mediate in terms that make sense to a Western person. And I don't particularly like the New Age discourse because it's just too fluffy and indulgent. And, and like, where's your proof? Or where's your empirical? You know, you know, affirming yourself into something isn't necessarily the same thing as doing the work. I am healed, you know, really. You know, if you could actually see what's going on with you, you wouldn't say that. But anyway. <laughs> this is kind of the danger with our podcast, too. We've attracted a lot of people who think that's what we're talking about. And, you know, they come to us and they're like... Because they have their own framework, right? They're looking for a specific thing and they only hear what they want to hear. They don't hear all the other stuff. This is not a joyride. If you feel, and it is a buzzword, it is a trending meme in terms of, you know, ayahuasca, it is hard work at the end of the day. It is for the strong of will and strong of mind and strong of spirit to be able to submit to an experience that goes beyond what you know, to enter the unknown, to enter what in Latin is called the mysterium tremenda, the, the mystery that surrounds every single moment of our lives, you know, beyond our wildest imaginings, and to be able to really work with darkness and shadow. This whole idea of love and light and we need to transcend transcend our nature and, and become beings of light. And then you see yes. them get into arguments in their daily life over the exactly. simplest, silliest things. And you're like, you're not you're not observing these Or have insane or repressed sexual energy, which a lot of yeah. these new age hippies do. And you just see it walking up to them. I'm <laughs> so zen. <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> Um, is like Carl Jung said, a uh, tree can only grow to heaven if its roots reach down to hell. I, that phrase just keeps repeating over and over for me. It's it's profound. Actually, Carl Jung is one of the psychologists that I've been reading recently, and he got a lot of the stuff. I mean, I don't know how much experience he had with psychedelics himself. I think none. He only really started getting into shamanism way later in his life, and then he kind of put it down as something. I have to study that at some point, and I don't think he ever really did. He had some very deep insights. And one of the ideas that he had is that he kind of felt um, quite bitter towards Christianity. He thought that they got it quite wrong. And uh, he studied pagans and then the alchemists, and he noticed that they had this connection to the realms, you know, the, to their animal nature and also to their divine nature. And they were very large beings in a way. And then Christians came in and said, okay, we're going to just cut that all off, you know, nature, you have to be in relationship with it, it's not you, and then God, you have to be in relationship with it, it's also not you, you're just stuck. It's like they took an ice cream scoop of what they think people are, and they're like, that's you, no, none of this (laughs) other stuff is you, only that. Yeah, we've been talking with a friend, actually, and unpacking a lot of the kind of history of Christianity and why it is the way it is and how, you know, it's, it's a religion of the oppressed and it's a desert religion and originates from from Egypt in many ways, and the Egyptians were sun worshippers and male-centric, and that it was very much different from the paganism that dominated Europe before Christianity, which worshipped nature and uh, male and and female uh, energies equally. And um, so Jung thought that it was kind of almost Christianity's fault that uh, Europeans are, are the way that they are, that they're so repressed, that they're miserable, that there's a, so much mental illness. Um, because when he went to visit the tribes, he didn't see that. People were very serene and connected. And even when they were kind of a warrior tribes, they didn't have this kind of uh, angst and anxiety and depression that Europeans tend to have. Can I add something? I mean, very often these, not just the Christian tradition, but the Semitic traditions, let's put it that way, the monotheistic Semitic traditions, whether it's Judaism, uh, Islam, and Christianity and Islam, they're very much obsessed about controlling the body you know, in very specific domains. And uh, that's something that is not so much a concern within uh, indigenous communities. In fact, they're encouraged to sing and dance. This is the main thing. And what do the Puritans focus on? Repressing singing, repressing dance, and repressing sexuality. Defunding. <laughs> de- de- what? Defunding. Basically, yes. I mean, so that's got to have something, some impact on the human psyche, definitely. Whereas if you have a community that supports that. And uh, when I was in South Africa recently, I was, I was doing some training with a, um, a Sangoma tradition, the Zulu shamans. And the power of the drum of close range when it's a whole, you know, uh, battery of people playing, it's transcendent and it's, it's completely uh, alters consciousness very quickly. You know, and then these beings can kind of work through you and ancestral connections and all that. But I mean, and that's, I think, one of the things that um, people are looking for. They're looking for that sense of rootedness in nature, these um, 
I mean, if organized religion works for you, then, you know, you have my blessing. Good for you. If it actually fulfills you. But a lot of people are finding that those kind of uh, injunctions and, and way of perceiving the world is, is not reaching them at a soul level. They want more. They want this authenticity of experience. They want this direct knowledge. They don't want to be communicated about what they should believe. They want to have this uh, knowledge emerging from their own experience. Basically, and that's partly what is explaining the rise of popularity in various forms of shamanism across the Western world, because they want to connect with, you know, we're so far removed from nature. We're, we, you know, we live 24-hour cycles, that not necessarily circadian, do you know what I'm saying? And all the technology around us and screen time and, oh, goodness, people are beginning to realize that they want a bit more. Yeah. Hence the popularity of Harry Potter. <laughs> yeah. yeah. children. All right, that's the end of part one of our interview with Don Roberto. For show notes, go to futurethinkers.org slash 60. The second part will be out shortly, and the show notes will be in the same place. If you're new to the show and you'd like a list of our top episodes and resources, go to futurethinkers.org slash start. If you want to sponsor our show, go to futurethinkers.org slash sponsor. If you like our podcast, leave us a rating and a review on iTunes and elsewhere. It helps others find the show, and we really appreciate it. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you in the next episode. Bye! Bye.